another childhood nostalgia thing of the week. Me too. Because so much of the stuff I still like now, my tastes haven't changed that much. Mine have, but I agree. I I had a hard time doing more than one thing of the week. This was a hard one. Because when I was thinking of, oh, what were my favorite childhood movies? When I was six, I loved Top Gun. We already did that. (laughs) Uh, I love the Joy Luck Club when I was like nine. Uh-huh. I think we will do that at some point. Okay. And then when I was 12, I think my favorite movie was Menace to Society. And I think that's worth a full episode as well. Cool. And none of those are like childhood. Those aren't like kid movies. Those aren't kid movies, no. So then I thought like, well, then it's what? Aladdin? That's just, that's too easy? Yeah. Yeah. I looked at all the Disney ones and I was like, I was really into them. What was your favorite Disney as a kid? Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, it's the best one. Yeah. It still is. It still is. And Lion King, yeah. for sure. Because I think Lion King came out, like, I experienced, like, the hype around it, right? Like, right. you see the the trailer, and then you see the, and the like... the VHS. VHS. It was maybe the biggest selling VHS of all time. It might still be. Yeah, and I it definitely had it. Big um, white clamshell. Oh, those clamshells were, like, iconic. Well, let's get into it, and maybe we'll hear about one of these. But welcome, everyone, to another Childhood Nostalgia edition of yeah. I Love This, You Should Too. My name is Indy Menace to Society Randawa, and with me is the beauty herself, Samantha Randawa. Oh, thanks. <laughs> How are you, Indy? Uh, terrible. Like, yeah, I know. Honestly, we're both not in good shape. No, like Indy hurt himself at hockey yesterday. Yeah, my and... hip is like pretty bad. I get hurt a lot, and you're like, no big deal, but <laughs> I, I can't move He's my like leg. He's like hobbling around, and it's it's a little scary because Indy's not one to like give in to injuries. <laughs> my body's given up on me. Yeah, and I just had my first week back, or my first day back at work after like two weeks off, and it was uh, quite the day. So we're both uh, a little off our game, I think. That's what you want to hear when you're out there. It's like, hey, this is going to be a shitty episode. (laughs) We feel like garbage. So listen up. So, Indy, what are we doing? Well, we will each have a spoiler-free thing of the fortnight. And then I'll reveal the big watch for next week. I'm excited. And we are continuing our theme that we did over the last two weeks of some childhood nostalgia picks. Yeah. Where you talked about some childhood books you loved. I talked Transformers. We watched Barbie and talked all about that. Spoiler, mine's not a book. Ooh. (laughs) Which never happens. So get excited for that. But Indy, why don't you start us off and give us your spoiler-free thing of the fortnight? So just like I was saying, it's not exactly a kid pick, but you know what? This reminds me of being a kid. Mm -hmm. So picture it. Picture Miami, 1989. Four best friends share a bungalow and a bunch of cheesecake. Because my thing of the week is the Golden Girls. Oh, Golden Girls. I do know a little bit about this just because you're always watching it. I'm doing a watch through right now. I watched it a little bit as a child because my grandma liked this show. Oh, yeah. Because I think I assumed at the time, just because this was the only other show with grandmas on it. Um, I'm not sure if that was the case. And watching it now, I wonder how much she understood because her English was not very good. And Uh. this show has a lot of jokes and a lot of really, really dirty jokes. And they speak really quickly on this show. That too. So I feel like if you're not super well versed in English, this like I could see this going over your head a little bit. But maybe she just liked hanging out with her best four girlfriends. I know I do because I'm watching <laughs> it right now, and man, it is it is good. It is ahead of its time, and it is hilarious. I have to agree with you because you'll have it on when you're cooking, and I'll come hang out in the kitchen with you while you're cooking, and like. I'm not doing the full watch through with you, but I've seen probably like 10 episodes now. Maybe more. Yeah. Maybe more. Um, and like, I think I laugh like every time I'm watching it. So that's a good sign. 
It, the the comedy writing, the insult comedy especially, is yeah. very good in this show. Yeah. So the show is about four women, all of whom had been married at one point, but now are single. And they are living in a house together and they get into all sorts of hijinks. So many hijinks. There is uh, Rose Nyland, played by Betty White. And she's an idiot. She's real dumb. That's her bit. But often you can find this bit of wisdom in her innocence. Mm -hmm. Uh, She's from St. Olaf, Minnesota. And she doesn't let you forget it. She's (laughs) always telling stories. And they're always ridiculous. And they usually go nowhere. How can you not love that performance? Yeah. And Betty White's a gem. Oh, my God. Yeah. (laughs) It's always nice to see her in things. I was trying to think of a favorite St. Olaf story, but I can't remember all of them because there's so many of them. But I remember one when she was talking about there was two parties who were arguing about what to do with the the herring. One person wanted to pickle them and the other person wanted to have a circus. And Rue McCallaghan and B. Arthur, it looks like their characters are breaking. Like the actors are laughing. It seems like it's not in character because they keep asking questions and stifling laughter. And they're asking if they ever shot the herring out of a cannon. And she said, just once, into a tree. And they just lose it. And it's not even her funniest story. But just seeing all (laughs) of them have that fun together made that one maybe my favorite uh, St. Olaf story. I feel like there's a St. Olaf story like every episode. There is. Yeah, Yeah. there definitely is. That and a picture it, Sicily, 1929. Yes. (laughs) Which brings us to Estelle Getty playing Sophia Petrillo, who is Dorothy's mom. And Estelle Getty is, she's my favorite golden girl. Oh, she's so funny. She is hilarious. I love insult comedy and Sophia does it the best. Mm -hmm. I was just watching an episode today and she's talking to her daughter and she says, jealousy is a very ugly thing, Dorothy. And so are you in anything backless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And then in another episode, she was talking about her her ex and Blanche says like, oh, I didn't know that you have a past too. And she was like, of course, everyone has a past. But unlike you, I don't need penicillin to get through it. Ew. <laughs> like they're they're so uh, mean to each other. Yeah. But that's part of the charm. And Sophia is my favorite because she really epitomizes that insult comedy. And then there is her daughter, Dorothy Spornak, played by B. Arthur. Mm-hmm. And B. Arthur is just um like a hero. She's she's awesome. I love B. Arthur so she's much. Great. She's done so much other good work beyond Golden Girls, but she is great in this. She's this no nonsense substitute teacher, and she comes off mean a lot of the time. But she is that strong will that stands up and protects her friends from yeah. other people. It so, seems like one of those situations of like I can insult them, but you can't. Yes, absolutely. Like, I'm allowed to say mean things, but. If you do, you're going to have some trouble. And oftentimes, being older single women, there are people who are trying to take advantage of them, Mm -hmm. selling them things they don't need, things like that. And Dorothy is the one to come up and shut it all down. Yeah. And one time, protect them all when they were in prison. Oh, I haven't seen that episode. (laughs) That was a good one. (laughs) And then that brings us to Rue McCallaghan, who plays Blanche Devereaux, who is the southern one. Oh, and I should say that Sophia is from Sicily, of course, because she's always talking yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. Dorothy from New York. So they are all people from different parts of America, too, and one being an immigrant. So they're kind of showing you different uh, sides of that kind of um, American tapestry. Yeah. And, and they bring a lot of that into their characters. Like, the New York one is tough. The Midwestern one is more the innocent. And the southern one is... I don't know what you say that's uh, not insulting because they insult her so much. <laughs> she she has a lot of sex, Blanche does. She that does. is her defining characteristic. She is the Southern Belle and she is often made fun of because of that. But you know what? It's not going to stop her. No. No, she, she seems to like enjoy life to the fullest, which is kind of what you want to do. And yeah. it's very aspirational. But uh, her friends definitely don't let her live it down. <laughs> yeah. Sophia called her a human mattress on the episode yesterday. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, it was the setup was even better because Blanche was like, why are you always insulting me? And Sophia says like, well, it's a defense mechanism. Sometimes when I'm upset, I lash out like that. And Blanche goes, oh, OK, I understand. She goes like, thank you, you human mattress. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so they insult each other a lot, but it's clearly from a place of love. In one episode, Blanche's daughter visits, and they had been estranged for a long time. So mm-hmm. it's about rekindling that mother-daughter relationship that has deteriorated. And also she comes back and she has gone, gained a lot of weight in the meantime. And everyone's kind of making fun of her. They're doing all these bits. And you're like, oh, I don't know how I feel about this. But then the daughter's boyfriend comes in and he joins in on it. And then they shut it down and they shut him down too. Because uh-huh. it's one of those like, we can do it because we love. Yeah. You cannot. You have no. not proven you yourself. You are a jerk if you do that. And it's it's so much dirtier than I remember. There's so much sex talk. It's mostly about sex. Sex and cheesecake. Those are probably the two things that are on the show the most. I feel like I haven't had that much cheesecake content, but... That... Whenever there's a problem, they sit down and they have cheesecake oh, and they, okay. they hash it out. It's a lot of sitting down and talking. But I I love it because the writing is so quick and all of them give these awesome, quick, witty performances <laughs> that it works. You can just have an entire episode of them sitting around a table eating cheesecake and I am compelled. And... In the 80s and early 90s, you could just do that on TV shows. Huh. Like there would be a whole episode of The Cosby Show where he's just making Rudy a sandwich. That's the episode. Oh, yeah. you were, I remember when you did this as your thing of the week. And it's definitely a different time of television. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can't do stuff like that anymore. No, and I wish you could. It has to be like flashy and quick and like moving along. And If you have funny writing and good performers, I can watch them just sit and talk. Yeah. It's great. People love podcasts. But then again, now we just have podcasts and we put that on YouTube and we call it something. Just sure. make a sitcom just like that. Just make a sitcom. Make it scripted. <laughs> But despite all of this, they do get into a lot of serious stuff. And a lot of the ways they deal with all of these things make it really ahead of its time. Like a lot of people probably forget that Rose was addicted to painkillers and goes to rehab in an episode. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. This show also has some of the first gay characters I'd ever seen on TV. There's Dorothy's college friend. Blanche's brother is gay. And they make jokes about it, but... At the end, it always comes down to like, but you are the same person that I loved before I knew this, and I love you still. Yeah. And not a lot of shows were doing that, especially at this time. There's one where one of Sophia's friends is suffering from dementia and can't remember her, and then it doesn't have a happy ending. He can no longer go out on his own, and that's how that one ends. She loses that friend. That's so sad. And they have sad ones like that. We also get a glimpse of Blanche's mother. There's this um, Mother's Day episode where they have four little stories and each about a mother-daughter relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's Blanche visiting her mother on Mother's Day. And her mom can't remember who she is. But she still finds comfort in her company. Oh, that's that's, so sad. Yeah, it is. But it was still like sweet. Like heartwarming. Yeah, I could see that. That's a lot of really like heavy and big topics to cover on a show that's as like fun and quippy as it is. And they keep the fun quippiness yeah. going even when Rose has an HIV scare. What? That was a thing. We don't need to get into that one though. Uh, Dorothy is sick and none of the doctors believe her. So she becomes frustrated and depressed. And that's a thing that a lot of women experience too because- yeah. Statistically, you are believed less by medical professionals, medical especially at that at that age. Absolutely. Once Sophia becomes romantically involved with a Japanese man and a relationship like that, especially amongst old people, you wouldn't see very often True. on TV. And they make some jokes about the language barrier, but it's not about belittling this man. It's hmm. just that they can't communicate well, right. and that leads to some funny bits. Mario Lopez is on an episode and he's a child and he gets deported and they are just like handcuffed by immigration law. And they're like, this is an injustice, but what can we do? The answer was not much. Wow. Dorothy's son also marries a black woman and first both families are against it, but then they reconcile because their old prejudices aren't worth losing contact with a family member. And they realize like, you know what? What other choice do we have? We have to grow. The world is growing and changing and we have to as well. I did see that one and it was actually a very good 
It was a well done episode for sure. Um, with kind of a, even now a kind of a touchy topic. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really nice to see the way that they handled that and then um, kind of how they resolved it at the end, which was really nice. What I especially love about how they handle all of this is we see these topics on shows today. Of course. But how it's handled is much more uh, careful. This show still makes the jokes. Oh, yeah. They attack full out, but trust in the viewer that the message at the end is good. And yes, we are going to have fun along the way. And it doesn't have to be that anything serious is off limits and can't be joked around about. Right. Because they joke about everything, but they also have those great messages in the end. It just sometimes takes a bit of a a journey to get to that uh, happy, usually happy end. I also saw one where they have to spend a night in a homeless shelter and that makes them realize their own privilege, but also they each meet somebody different and they get to hear the story of why they are there. So go watch it. It's currently streaming on Disney+. Plus. They have 180 episodes to get through, so it should keep you for a while. Great performances, hilarious writing, great insult comedy, but... In the end, it always comes back to heart and to friendship and to cheesecake. <laughs> so and go watch The always. Golden Girls. <laughs> How about you, Samantha? What is your nostalgic thing of the week? Um, Like I said at the beginning of the episode, it was like very hard for me to think of another one that I was like really nostalgic about. But then I thought about... um. Like rainy days when we couldn't go out for recess or when we were about to be dismissed for Christmas break and we'd get a movie put on. And um, my nostalgic childhood thing of the fortnight is the animated educational children's television series, The Magic School Bus. Oh, I'm a big fan. (laughs) So The Magic School Bus... um, ran from 1994 to 1997. Um, I didn't know that Miss Frizzle was voiced by Lily Lily Tomlin, Tomlin, which I just learned that today as I was doing research. Um, It is based on a book series called The Magic School Bus, and um, Miss Frizzle and her class go on far-out adventures around the galaxy. Um, I used to love this show, um, and I read a list of like the episodes and I'm like a hundred percent sure that I've seen every single one at least once. Um, Miss Frizzle and her class go places like the solar system into a digestive system, germs. They learn about germs. Um, They learn about the food chain. They learn about habitats through a frog They learn about decomposition, desert adaptation, and sound. Um, Just to name like a few of the, I think there's like 77 episodes. Um, So, so yeah, it's um, definitely fun. In the Magic School Bus, they can shrink down or get really, really big. Um, They can also go into space. They can go under the sea. The Magic School Bus is basically whatever you want it to be. Um, do you have a favorite episode that you remember? The first one I think of is the digestive system one. Yeah, that one's definitely uh, a fun one. And um, they shrink down and go inside one of Miss Frizzle's students' digestive system. Yeah, because he's sick, right? Isn't that um, what it is? No. Oh, that's a, that might be a different one. That's a different one. So Arnold swallows a piece of gum. Right. And they want to know what happens to the gum. So they go inside of Arnold on the little tiny magic school bus and they learn all about the digestive system. And the one that you're thinking of with the germs was Ralphie is sick and um, they go inside of him to see about how germs are processed in the body and how um, your body fights off illness. Both like very broad complex topics that they managed to break down and make like child friendly which is like amazing it's just a it's a fantastic show because 
it was one of the very few shows as a child that I was very aware that this is for educational purposes. Yes. And was still great and entertaining. It was so much fun to watch. And, you know, like every time you got to watch a episode, it was always a very special day. <laughs> um, as the seasons went on, they got a little bit more complex and diverse in the uh, in the topics that it covered. But um, it definitely kept people wanting to learn science. I remember like actually being interested in the topics um not being a super sciencey kid it was always like kind of a struggle for me to learn about science but i found this very accessible and kind of piqued my interest in some of these topics i believe it has been rebooted in the last few years do you know anything about that cuz i don't it has so in 2017 netflix ordered a season of this show and um, I haven't watched any of it. I don't know if I'm just like a, a purist. <laughs> but it's like too nostalgic from my childhood for me to want to like get back into it. I understand that feeling. Um, so it is available on Netflix. Um, are the old ones on there too? I No, they uh. are all on YouTube though. Oh, great. Um, that I'm sure is saving elementary teachers around the world oh, all the time. forever and ever. Um, yeah, so Kate McKinnon played Miss Frizzle. Oh, interesting. Another Kate McKinnon episode. <laughs> I think I'll probably check out an episode or two. Yeah. Um, so if you are looking for something family friendly to watch or just want to go back in time and enjoy something you enjoyed as a child, check out the Magic School Bus. And then those kids grow up and meet Captain Planet, right? Do they? Yeah, isn't that the same kids? I don't think so. I think it might be. Oh, I don't know about that. I'll uh, send you a picture and then you'll be like, oh no, it's the same kids. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I want to see that picture then. So I'm sending an image over to Samantha now. Look at those kids. Oh my God, those are the same kids. How? How? I think it's them. Wow. That is them. That is totally them. Um, one thing I didn't mention was that it was um, very ethnically diverse yes. as well, which was something that you weren't getting in cartoons at the time. I really appreciated that because anytime I would see a non-white kid in a TV show. And this was the period when they were starting to like kind of force that in there. Yeah. They would have an accent. Right. And this was the first time where I would see kids who weren't white who just sounded like everyone because everyone would always tell me like, oh, why don't you have an accent? It's like, because I was born in Edmonton. <laughs> yeah. This is the accent yeah. of someone born in Edmonton. So it was nice to see that for me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think they did a good job of not making it like... Yeah, not making the characters be like caricatures of themselves. It wasn't tokenism. It's nope. like one kid happened to be Jewish, one kid was black, and they all just, you yeah. know, were going to school together. They acted to like together. kids. Were yeah, black. exactly. And they didn't make a big deal about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So check out Magic School Bus. Please. Um, so, Indy, it's time. What are we watching for next week's episode? Well, I'm going to take off a little bit from your pick last week when we were talking a lot about mothers and daughters. Now we're going to talk a little bit about fathers and sons. Okay. We are going to watch the first independent film that I fell in love with. At the time, <laughs> it was the highest grossing independent film of all time. Oh, wow. It's something that shows you what you can do when you get outside of the studio system and you because oftentimes the studio system limits your creativity. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to go independent, you can just do whatever you want. So we're going to watch a movie about teenagers growing up in New York City. It's about teenagers, but it's also about mutants. It's about <laughs> ninjas. But most of all, Samantha, it's about turtles. Aww. We will be watching the 1990 smash hit. Smash Teenage it. Mutant Ninja Turtles. Okay. What do you know about this movie? Um, I know that there are turtles dressed like ninjas. And I know that they're named after painters. Right. <laughs> um, other than that, oh, they live in the sewers and they like pizza? 
All true. Okay, that's that's it. That's my list. So we're not going to go into the whole um, Ninja Turtle universe. Right. Uh, the brief version is it was a comic book. It was kind of dark and gritty and satirical. Then a toy company came along and said, we can um, make toys off of this. So they made the cartoon show really just to sell toys. Did very well, sold lots of toys, and did so well that they decided to make a movie. And that's where we come in with uh, the Ninja Turtles movie. It's been a lot of things since then, a lot more movies, some fine, some terrible, but we're not going to get into all of that. We are going to talk about the 1991, which is, I should say, was my amazing to me in 1990. I saw it when I was five, <laughs> and I think this might have been the first time I went to a movie theater. Ooh, okay. It is definitely my first memory in a movie theater. Actually, I've... Three. When I was on vacation in 1989, I got to go to a movie. Okay, yeah. And I saw Jason Takes Manhattan. Oh. <laughs> My parents took me. They didn't know what it was. Oh, that's so funny. It really is. Huh. Yeah, I shouldn't have seen that as a five-year-old. Oh, but... uh, your parents. <laughs> <laughs> Little did they know they were shaping young Indy. They really the, were. The person he is today. It's funny. I never was into movies. I started making movies when I was six. Right. But I didn't really watch them until a little later. Oh, weird. It was weird. That's an odd like, chain of events. Then. Yeah. Huh. So we're going to watch that. This is one of those, will it be terrible now? Who knows? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the last time I had seen it. It may have been 30 years ago. Hmm. Okay. Um, I own it on Blu-ray, though, so I must have seen it at some point. Although, maybe I just bought it and never even watched it. Nostalgia buy. Yeah, it might have been. Yeah. I think it was a nostalgia Boxing Day sale buy <laughs> a couple of years back. Yeah, those those happened. So, we are going to watch it. I don't think we need much more of a preamble today. We're going to talk all about it tomorrow. Excellent. So, go watch the 1990 version of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and we'll talk all about it next week. Perfect. I do want to ask you, though, what are your expectations or hopes? Oh, I don't even know. I feel like I don't know enough about Ninja Turtles to have expectations or hopes. I hope it's fun. But if someone told you we're going to watch a movie about... I mean, the title gives you a lot of information. <laughs> I hope we find out why they're mutants mm -hmm. and why they chose the ninja life. Okay. And You know what I hear, though? You don't choose the ninja life. It the ninja you. life chooses you. Uh, I hope I learn a little bit more about that. I also hope that there's pizza. Mm -hmm. And uh, that the Ninja Turtles have a fun time. I, I, I can only hope that all of those come true as well. <laughs> Is that, is that good? I'm excited. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, we are going to watch the 90-minute perfect, perfect Love It Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and we'll talk all about it next week. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.